And you heard a short bio. The film, by the way, you can find out there. It's an 8th Air Force film clip. And it really defines me. And you would have recognized maybe no faces, but I hope you could project your face on those whom I have served with. I had the distinct pleasure, uh, except for my freshman year, of being a cadet, <laughs> and then 35 years in our Air Force, serving with uh, a bunch of great Americans. A couple criminals, they're somewhere else now, but a bunch of great Americans. And through that time, I learned quite a bit, right? For all of us, we all have our own individual experiences. I never assume I'm the smartest person in any room, and I would never pretend to have your life experience. So what you're gonna hear is a perspective from a person who's not a philosopher, though my daughter might tell you I am, who's not a PhD, though I've been to a couple schools, but a practitioner a practitioner of leadership, an observer, a learner, and someone who fought hard to take care of mission and people. Slide, please. So if you're in America and you're gonna talk about ethical leadership, you know, who do you talk about? You know, George Washington. This is a great painting, right? 75 years after George Washington actually crossed the Delaware. And you would say George Washington, right? If you're a Vince Lombardi fan, you know that he believes that leaders can be made, right? Not just born, or they made or born. They're both, right? There are some people who have some natural attributes that make it really easy for them to lead, if they choose to lead. And there are other people who aspire to make a difference and choose to lead. So you might have started out ahead of the pack, but if you're not careful, the pack quickly catches up. If you truly believe that leaders can't be made, they're just born, then what would be the reason for an Air Force Academy? What would be the reason to read about leadership? And if you Google leadership, there's like two million hits, right? Leaders, of all of George Washington's wonderful attributes, right, and a bunch of myths, if you look at what the scholars say, they will tell you that character was his most important attribute. Trust. Leadership is a relationship, right? A relationship between people and among people that's based in mutual respect, if you're doing it right, and you generate an environment in which both the leader and the followers trust each other. Trust. Next slide, please. So today I'm going to talk about three things that help you establish that trust that I think in the years that I spent in our Air Force and frankly throughout my entire life I feel are most important. I'm going to simplify, not because I don't think you're, you're smart, but because I have a short period of time and I would like to throw as much up there so you can mine a nugget or two or maybe learn a lot from what I have to say and from my experiences. So I'm gonna start with your colors, right? So I'm wearing school colors today. Your colors. If you say somebody's true colors, typically you're referring to their character. Ah, they've shown their true colors. Say, I knew they were gonna fail or I knew they were gonna do that. That's who they really are. That's fair. But I would ask you, as a leader, to consider your colors much more broadly than that. I call them the core attributes and behaviors, the be-do of being a leader. 
Who are you and what do you do? And are your actions consistent with who you are? By the way, I have a real problem in discerning the difference between what attributes a leader should have and a follower should, should have. And I really have a problem with subordinates who think they're just followers and don't understand that their leader needs them to lead up, needs them to help out, needs them to lead across and down also. Any effective team doesn't have anyone on the bench. Everybody's on the field fighting for it. So I threw a bunch of words up there and I'm gonna give you just a couple minutes to, to look at the words. And then I'll offer you a few thoughts. Character. Credibility, commitment, courage, and your ability to communicate. You can blame other people for the condition you're in, and some of that blame might be justified. In any case, if your condition is bad, you should do something about it. If your condition is good, you should do something about it. And if it's great, you can get better. Character, it starts with you, right? There's no I in team. Oh, but there's a me. If you mix those letters around, there's a me. And if your team is gonna be strong and you're weak, you owe the team more effort. And if you're already strong and you have some weak team members, then they need your help. Character. Be worthy of your role. Be worthy of your promise. So if you're going to be an ethical leader, you have to be a leader first. You have to choose to lead. You have to have the energy to lead. Credibility. If you're no good at your job, it's pretty tough to be a credible leader. You might be nice, but somebody else is going to lead your, your organization. You've got to be good. But if the standard, right, if the minimum is easy to achieve for you, then that's not your bar. Your bar is somewhere much higher than that. Much higher. Credibility. If you're tall and you play basketball great, you'll probably be able to pick the team. But if you're a jerk after the game, your team's going to walk away. If you're a professional, you have to sustain that leadership. So you have to sustain the quality of your character and your devotion to your credibility. You have to be committed. You have to be committed to your mission and to your people. All right, selflessness. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, you've got to be selfish first to be selfless. If you're no good or if you're not getting better, you're not helping the team. So you've got to start with you. If you're not positive and you're the leader, how can the team be positive? If you're a downer, if you're not trying to inspire by what you do, it's okay to aspire to inspire. It's all right. That's a great aspiration. Commitment. Courage. There's all kinds, right? We all know courage, the face of fire. Well, courage to go to work when you don't feel like it. 
courage to change the plan when it was your idea and you just figured out that that idea is not that good. <laughs> courage to point at somebody and say thanks when that person just corrected you in public. Courage. And if you can't communicate, you better find somebody who can. If you have the best idea and nobody knows what it is, how are they going to execute? You've got to be able to communicate. Do you just communicate to the next level in your organization? Oh, no. Leaders fix problems. As a three-star general, the next person will probably say, sir, we got it. Don't worry about it. You're okay. All right. I'm okay. Do I trust them? Sure. Do I verify? Uh-huh. <laughs> when I was a wing commander, if I want to know how the airplanes were, I could go to the maintenance operations center. I trusted them. But if I want to know how the crew chiefs were doing, I talked to a crew chief. Not a chief master sergeant or a colonel. Talk to the person who was doing the job. That takes energy, right? If you want, if you ask your folks to do something or you gave them an order, how do you know it's being carried out unless you're watching it happen? How do you know if the order got to the bottom if you never talk to your most junior folks? If your organization is not hitting on all cylinders, those are people. Are you in their way? These five C's, right? Five C's. As you're thinking about what I'm saying, think about how they apply to you. How good are you, and by the way, there's a million adjectives I could probably jam in 50 slides, but how good are you at least at these core ideas? Where can you improve? If you have someone in your organization who's trying hard, do you know what obstacle is in their way that's preventing them from both trying hard and being great? In the Air Force, not everyone can be chief of staff, but there is no limit on excellence. In your organization, it's okay to aspire to be the best, to be the boss. What you do to get there probably reflects on your character. But your fight to be there if the reason is to make the organization great and take care of people, it's a worthy fight. So we start with you and your colors. So what about this ethics thing? Well, you look back to character, right? Next slide. Or you think about all that philosophy that you learned. Ethics. Morality, ethics, what's the difference? Some people will say that morality is something personal. It's you, it's inside, it comes from inside out. And ethics are the rules of the society that you live in. So, ethics. Know what's right, sometimes that's not that easy. Do what's right. Everybody knows right from wrong. Sometimes people break a law unintentionally. It's possible, right, if you don't know the law. Ignorance of the law is no defense. Okay, there's that too. So how do you start? It's pretty simple for me when it comes to ethics. You start with your word. What did you promise to do? If you're wearing a uniform, you raised your right hand. If you're working for the government, you raised your right hand and promised. Right? That you will well and faithfully, well and faithfully, do the best you can every day, not some days. 
Bring it every day. And it's okay. It's okay to bring it every day. It made it really easy for me to get up every morning because I knew who I was doing it for. The people I worked with. The people who I had the privilege of commanding. There's no perfect people. If you know one, please tell me. So did I make mistakes? Uh-huh. But I didn't purposely hurt anybody. My purpose was to make people stronger, to make the unit stronger, to enable us to execute our mission. Because in the profession of arms, second place is not only the first loser, it also might mean that you die. Second place in a war means you've lost. So the stakes are too high. And you will say, well, yeah, it's not really the same with my job. Okay. So in your job, you may not stay up till midnight every night. By the way, I didn't. I tried not to. You may not have to. But what you can do is go fight the good fight. Be a person of your word. Meet your commitments. I worked for a four-star once as, uh, as his aide. And I'll use his name because this is not a bad story. This is a great story. John Michael Lowe, Mike Lowe. Last commander of Tactical Air Command, first commander of Air Combat Command. And I, I was new, and I was trying to make sure that he was that all the people that wanted to see him and, and needed to see him got to see him. So I was running all around. And he had a commitment with a small community group to speak at lunch in just a few days. But a very important group, politically important group, called and needed him at the same time. And there was this little hallway from my office to his office, kind of a back hallway. I knocked on the door and said, General, uh, we just got a request to speak at, for X organization. And he said, am I free? And I said, no, sir, you're not. You're going to speak over here, but if you'd like me to, I'll cancel that commitment. And I took more than one seat when I was his aide. He said, Greg, have a seat. <laughs> I said, oh, no. I just said something. I don't know what I said, but I said something bad. He said, he said, you're going to find out really fast that I keep my commitments to the people in this command and to the people I make commitments to. He said, it might be a small group, but they've told their friends and they're expecting me. They might have printed brochures and done all kinds of things that would honor me. And I owe it to them. So we're not going to change that. If that other organization can take me some other time and I have a space, I'm willing to speak with them. Keep your commitments. Commitment. Your word. Your word is your ink, right? That pen that you wave. Sign that paper. Okay. 15 pages. You flip to the last page, sign it. Oops. What was in the 15 pages? I walked into General Lowe's office, and he had this fountain pen. And he would sign with a fountain pen, and then he would take this ink blot dryer thing and dry his signature. I said, sir, you know, I've got a ballpoint pen here. We can knock these things out and rollerball something faster. He said, Greg, have a seat. Oh, no. <laughs> he said, what's more important than your signature? He said, I'm a four star. I have 100,000 people that work for me. And I'm about to change somebody's life or a lot of people's lives. I'm about to spend money and I need to think about that. So I take time with my signature. He said, get a sign and pen. I said, yes, sir. My son has my sign and pen. My daughter will get one too. Your word. And how about all the rest of that stuff? Right? Laws, instructions, orders, authorities. Leaders make decisions. It's the essence 
of leadership, according to Edgar Perrier, who interviewed over 100 general officers. The essence is the decision. The decision impacts. Are you making decisions consistent with the law? And if you know you're going to break a rule, and you have the authority to break it, break it away. Just let everybody know what's going on. And if you don't have the authority to break it, shouldn't your boss know that you're taking risk that's outside your authority? It's really important. So you gotta spend time with the rules. Tech orders, they set you free. If you do everything by the technical order, you're gonna be okay. Even if the airplane doesn't launch, you did everything by the book, that's okay. On the day you go outside the technical order, and you hurt a jet or a person, or you affect negatively your unit in any way, by the way, that's on you. Do you know your technical order? It's worth your time. But that won't get you ethical leadership, just following the rules. It keeps you safe. It's going to be a combination of fighting for what you have promised to do, understanding what your job is, right? Know your job, do your job, tell someone when you can't. But you've got to add your values in there, right? And maybe your personal values are different than your organization's values. For almost, you know, I'll probably lay money on, for everybody in this room, you know the difference between right and wrong. You probably know the rules of your organization. It's your values. Are you doing the right thing because some rule tells you to do it or because you believe in it? So that's where that morality comes in, and by the way, that ethical behavior. If you're following your organization's values, if you're true to them, integrity and service and excellence, those are, I, I want to be on a team with people who believe in that. I don't want to be on a team, on any team, with people who don't. When somebody joins your organization, they may not have those values. You don't know what they walked in with, but they need to at least have that. They might have no values at all. But if, if you're in the Air Force or in any organization, you have those three values, you're probably going to be okay. So you agreed to stand by your word. You're going to be a person of your, that meets your commitments. And you agree with the Air Force's values, and you have even deeper values of your own. And you're going to fight to understand what the rules are. Then you will lead ethically. You will. It's not that hard, right? But you've got to bring it every day. This isn't a sometimes thing. This is an everyday thing. It's an all-the-time thing. So right versus wrong isn't hard. It's right versus right that's hard. What do you mean, right versus right? Well, I've got to break this rule to take care of this person. Okay. Maybe it's the time to break that rule. Do you have the authority to do it? No. Are you going to ask your boss? Well, not in this case. Hmm. Is that ethical? I don't know. You tell me. Have I done that before? Uh-huh. And it was on me. That's now my risk. And I better be sure. Because what I don't want to do, that bucks up against another value. I don't want to hurt this organization or our mission. I don't want to waste a dollar. So does it do any of that? No, it doesn't do any of that. It's not going to hurt any of that. Okay, so I've made that choice. Would I make that choice for everyone in my organization or just the people I like? 
I'll tell you right now, I'll make that choice for everyone in my organization if that's what it is, and I'll fight to change that rule if the rule's the problem. And maybe I don't have time to change the rule right now. And that's why they gave me all that commander pay, right? But I better do it for everybody in my organization because that was my line between an ethical decision and an unethical decision. So you start with a foundation of character and credibility, of commitment, of courage, and making sure your folks know what kind of person you are and what kind of decisions you're making. And these days, yep, why? And you think about your word that I'm going to bring in every day. Are you going to be sick one day? Yeah. Are you going to be injured one day? Yeah. Are you going to be off your game one day? Uh-huh. You will be. But you're going to fight for it. And if you're going to fail, if you're, if you're struggling that day, you better grab your buddy and say, hey, Jake, help me out here. I'm dying. And hope that Jake can pick you up and carry you. Right? That's what any good team does. Because not everybody's going to be the best every day. On that day, when you all are your best, it's a great thing. you got to prepare, right, for the next day. You have to work to help prepare your folks for the next day. you got to get in the next day and make the tough decisions. And as you pile up all those decisions, you'll gain this wealth of experience that you will be able to go back deep into the well for on those days where your challenges are great. Next slide. Okay, so there I was. At Minot Air Force Base. As a new wing commander, and uh, if I'm lucky, I have uh, that squadron commander somewhere in the audience. And we're talking about battle staff actions, force protection conditions. What is this, sir? This is what the security forces do when we are in FBCOM Bravo, and this is what they do when we're in, in Charlie, and this is what we do in Delta. And we're generally over here in Bravo, and in. And the battle staff will convene if, if we get into a firefight at the gate and, and then they decide whether or not we should be in force protection condition delta. Well, what does that mean? Aren't you? Shouldn't we be in force protection condition delta if you're in a firefight at the gate? I mean, the attack is no longer imminent. We're in the, we're in the fight. Hell yeah. Well, sir, battle staff has to convene to direct that. I said, no, you tell me that we're in force protection condition delta if we're in a fight. All the others, I guess, we have time to think about, but not that one. If bullets are flying past your head, I'm pretty sure we're there. Tell me so I don't go walk into the command post and get shot in the head on the way. I need you to exercise the authority that I'm now giving you to protect our people in this mission. And I don't have any problem delegating that authority to you, trusting you to exercise that. And when we're in the, exer in the exercises, by the way, I'm going to start out by trusting you. But then prove to me you're worthy of that trust. Because you're a pro. You were a pro when I got here. Heck, that particular squadron was best in air combat command when I arrived. I also told that squadron that they had to check everybody's ID at the gate. 100%. What a pain. Everybody has to get, you know, roll down their window and show their ID, and it's a pain, and everybody. Does that include you, sir? Yeah, it includes me. Shortly after that, our tenant, one, the vice wing commander of our tenant union, our unit, goes through the gate without his ID card, in his sports car. Going to have a good day. Comes in, gets stopped at the gate by a young airman. Says, sir, I need to see your ID card. Well, you don't know who I am? Sir, I really doesn't matter who you are, I need to see your ID card. <laughs> well, now I'm mad. Okay, this person's my neighbor. 
He's mad at my airman at the gate for doing his job. Decision to make. Is this a hard decision? No. It's not a hard decision. There's a harmony issue, right? Two wings working together on the same installation. But it's not a hard decision. Don't be a jerk to my airmen. And by the way, do you know the UCMJ has this whole thing about how you treat sentries? So if you get weird with me, we'll, open, we'll get an attorney and open the UCMJ and show you where you can't be a jerk to an airman at the gate. Is that a big thing? No, it's not a big thing. Was it a big thing to that airman? That his wing commander had his back? Yeah, shouldn't be. I gave him the order. But it was. Is it ethical? Is that a hard decision? No, it's not a hard decision. Ethics. Who's the best person in your unit? Person you like the best? Or the person who does the best? When you're writing that report on that person, who gets the best score? The person who contributed the most or you think has the most potential? That's a tough one. Right? If that person who has the most potential is not living up to his or her potential, guess what? You need to get out there and lead and coach. And you might find that you were wrong about potential and that the person who's actually producing also has the most potential. And if you don't know that about those two people, you shouldn't write that report. It's ethics. Night one of Desert Storm. Never been to war. This is back end of the Cold War. During Desert Shield, a couple people who were great peacetime warriors decided they didn't want to fight. That's not good. They didn't live up to the word. That was unethical. We were struggling getting the mission planning done because the mission planning cell didn't want to share the mission because it was super secret. What do you mean it's super secret? I'm going to fly it. I need to have confidence in it. So don't stop me from doing the mission. It's ethical, right, to execute your promise. The group commander let us open the door to the mission planning cell. We took our bags for night one. We validated those bags, and there were a lot of mistakes. We then flew those ba bags over empty parts of the Indian Ocean and worked out the rest of the details in a night one at 200 feet with no moon in the sky, looking only through an infrared camera. The team, the large team, the macro team, put such a great plan together that at 47 minutes into the fight, the airfield I was striking still had all its lights on. They didn't know the war had started because of the work of special operators and cruise missiles and stealth fighters and a lot of planners and a lot of work. And we brought our aircraft over with dumb bombs and planted them, they look like precision bombs. I'd love to take credit, but on a B-52 you have two radar, and I had two radar navigators, and they were awesome. Your actions. Leading up to that, we had a squadron commander who was always negative. And that same group commander went deep enough to find out what that squadron commander's real problems were, and he had a lot more than just being negative and he made him go away. And a new commander arrived, who was not only an awesome operator, but a great leader. Took a group of people that hadn't fought together before, and by the time the war started, we were hitting on all cylinders. Didn't lose a jet or miss a target. Next slide. And your people are watching, 
right? They watch big things and small things. I'm a brand new squadron commander. Right, take command in July. And when do you start your Christmas party planning preparations? July, because you know, you gotta get the club and start doing that. So who's doing that for me? My lovely wife. And she was awesome the whole time. She should have got paid more than me, but she, she didn't. We split the paycheck though. <laughs> And she came home from the first meeting for the Christmas party, and she said, why are you so mad at work? I said, what? She said, why are you so mad at work? I said, I'm not mad at work. She said, you look mad right now. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not. Well, you, well, your folks think you are. They asked me, why is Colonel Biscone so mad at work? I said, I'm not mad at work. What am I doing to make them think I'm mad at work? I wasn't talking to anybody. I was busy. I had the mission. And I forgot that the people did the mission. The mission didn't do itself. Not some people, all the people. Who have I spoken to lately other than the officers in my squadron and the first sergeant? Nobody. Take five more minutes. Stop and talk. Find out how Airman Jones's life is, what their problems might be. So as a leader, I can fix their problems. People. And then we have the people in this room. People who've made a choice to come today to maybe learn something more and most likely take it somewhere else and share it. Who may learn more from each other than from any of the speakers in the conversations because you took time out to listen. Your ability to lead, the power in your leadership will be derived from the strength of your colors your commitment to your word, and your devotion to your mission and your people, your actions. Next slide. So here's a bunch of, so I hope this isn't death by PowerPoint, but this is kind of the easiest way for me to put it all on one slide. It's all interrelated, right? It's the source. Your colors, your values produce trust, teamwork, and improvement in your unit if you will keep your word and follow the rules, right? And change the rules when they're negatively affecting you. Sustained and powerful leadership is built on trust, right? Any relationship. This isn't magic. You can read a lot of books, and I recommend it. Read all you can about your chosen profession. And if you're a leader, about leadership. And you might get one more nugget that makes somebody stronger or enables your, your organization to succeed. But if you want to be effective, right, and sustained, you have to be, be perceived as ethical in the way you go about your work. It's all about meat and mission, taking care of people. There are many things. You'll see signs that say, people first, mission always. Well, it's not that, right? It isn't. Or we wouldn't send anybody to war because they get hurt at war. So it's about the mission. But I can't separate people out of the mission. So which one is first? Well, it's, it's mission. But people make the mission. And I, I need to take care of them. If you can't, as a leader, I would say fake it. You won't be able to fake it for long because your folks will know. And if you don't understand what I mean, when you do something great for someone and they're stronger because of it, and they're a better team member, you'll never have to fake it again. I don't recommend faking, but if that's what it takes, give it a shot. Your colors, your word, and your actions. Enable your mission enable you to meet people, strengthen people. 
Next slide. We don't have a ton of time. This is, uh, again, I was a guest group commander for OEF as a B2 group commander. Minot didn't have one, so I said, I'll go. I had to ask my wing commander. He said, we're in good shape. Take off. 100 days, Diego Garcia, pretty cool. Great group of people. Got to kill bad guys. Protect good people. That was all good. I rode on their shoulders. What questions do you have for me? Or comments? I have like 73 more war stories if you want. Sure. Sir, Mike Dillon, class of 73. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about uh, giving truth to power as you see it uh, on both sides of the equation. You say you're a squadron commander and you're Ops group commanders come up with what you think is the most asinine idea you've ever heard. How do you go about letting him know that? And then as the guy with the asinine idea, how do you go about making that decision? So I think that's pretty important. Oh, it is important. That's a great question. So I had that Are just before. Oh, well, here the question is, as a, as a squadron commander, uh, what happens when your group commander has an asinine idea? and you need to challenge him or her on that. And the opposite way, what happens if you were the boss and it's your bad idea? Well, for the second one, that's easy for me. It, it really is easy for me. Admit your mistakes. By the way, your, all your folks know that you made a mistake, right? Or it's a bad plan. Or maybe they don't, and you've decided that whatever input you just got was much more powerful, and you tell your folks. And guess what's gonna happen from that? The first time you do that, you will know, have to suck up a little ego, right? But the first time you do that, you're going to find out that after that day, more people are talking to you about their ideas and helping you improve the plan. And that was your objective in the first place. Now, if you only make bad decisions at some point, they're going to find another leader. <laughs> you'll either be fired or there will be an informal leader that makes those decisions. Just prior to OIF on the other question, I'm a group commander, and the wing commander, who is a really great guy, is about to say something that violates stealth principles <laughs> in front of the battle staff. And, and if you uh, know about B2s, you, uh, you're kind of a, a, a national power all unto yourself. Uh, you sometimes strike from white men and then come home. So I did that. Flew a 36.7 hour mission in OIF, back and forth with, with 80 bombs. But that wing commander, who I respected, was fired up and was launching down the wrong path. And he was upright in the battle staff, standing up. And I'm thinking, don't say that. So he's about to drop the asinine idea because I saw him writing down and I heard him say a few things. And so it's time for me to stand up too. I'm not as tall as him. I'm not as tall as most people in this room. But I stood up and we went chest to chest, which meant my forehead to his chin kind of thing. And I said, sir, you can't say that. I said, stop. He goes, what are you doing? I said, just stop talking. Uh, I, I got to take you to the vault so you understand what you're about to say. And he was put in a bad position, right? If you haven't been in, in stealth aircraft, you may not know what, well, he did not know that what he about, was about to say was an order that he would have to be really embarrassed about because he'd have to turn that around before we'd launch those jets. I would say, with as much dignity and as privately as possible, challenge your boss. But I would tell you this. If you're in government work, it's about service, right? We call it the service. I was in the service. Are you really? Or are you in an occupation? Are you in the profession of arms, or is this a job? When I, the, the day of my squadron change of command, when I became a squadron commander, uh, I drove home with my wife and I looked at her and said, Debbie, I love you, but on any day a moving truck might come up in front of our house because I'm gonna do the right thing, whether it's popular or not. I wanna make sure before I dive on a sword that it's worthy of the fight but I'm gonna do the right thing. 
And you can do that. By the way, when I joined this Air Force, eh, some, some bosses you couldn't. They would shoot you in the head and you'd be dead. No one would ever know what you said. But in today's Air Force, uh, our bosses listen. And I know General Goldfein personally. He was my neighbor at bowling before I retired. He listens. And he wants all Air Force leadership, officer and enlisted, to listen and to make decisions that are valuable for our people and our Air Force. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. How much time do we have? Two or three? Please. I actually, uh, so I, could you hear that question? Uh, I, for mentorship, it was those characteristics. I didn't know it at the time. I put this kind of together. When I became a squadron commander, I thought, you know, I'm supposed to say something profound. What, what am I supposed to say to my folks? Those were the, the expectations I had for them. And they should have those for me. You know, if. If, uh, if I expect this out of you, you better expect it out of me. Not do as I say, not as I do. Do as I say and as I do. And so I looked for these, these, those five C's. I've used those before. And I looked for eth ethical behavior. I didn't want to deal with that person who wasn't. And I knew some. Uh, by the way, this Air Force that we're in today, in fact, society, it's pretty transparent. There's really bad things about having cell phones. Everybody can take pictures of everything, put them on the internet. <laughs> But it's something good about that. Bad people have a much tougher time getting away with doing bad things. If you're not doing bad things, you've got nothing to worry about, right? Was there anybody that was outside of the Air Force that was a mentor to you? My first mentor? No, it, um, let's see, outside of the Air Force. Outside of the Air Force, <laughs> I, I have people outside the Air Force but in other services. Uh, and that's just because of who I was, who I contacted. Did I listen to the advice of local community members when it came to how our Air Force members were impacting the, the uh, local community? Yeah, I did. So I listened. Uh, my last mentor in the Air Force was General Dempsey, you know, so the last chairman. Uh, General Dunford was the commander of ISAF when I was the ODRP chief in Pakistan, and we saw each other a couple times a month. And, uh, and he was a mentor of mine as a Marine when he was on the Joint Staff and I was on the CENTCOM staff. So I, I was looking for not just people ab above me, but I had many very talented people by the way, if you're a leader and nobody's talking to you except that next level of supervision, you're in trouble, right? <laughs> Go find somebody junior who'll talk to you. And, by the way, listen to the wise counsel of those officers at that next level and make those same dis discriminations on, on who's giving you everything and who's just giving you sunshine.